Chapter 1, Colliding Worlds, Part 2. So we left off Part 1 with Columbus talking about him. This, this era is called contact. We don't call it discovery anymore. It's contact. What does that mean? It means the, the first time that Europeans and Native Americans, indigenous people of the Americas, made contact with each other after being separated because of the melting the ice age and separating these two these two land masses okay we talked about civilization how you know the the idea of an advanced state of human society might mean one thing to one culture versus another what does that exactly mean an advanced state of may not be the same thing to somebody else you gotta be careful of words like civilization and what that means and and categorizing somebody as uncivilized uh not not in their culture okay so um it's one of those words that can get us in, into some trouble. Okay. Okay. So let's um, let's watch a, a film here. This is entitled "The Black Legend: Native Americans and Spaniards," and this is a this is a crash course film. And what that is, we'll, we'll be seeing a lot of these. Uh, I really like these crash course films because they're not the traditional boring documentary. They're very funny, and they're directed towards the social media generation. But, but more importantly, also not not Eurocentric or ethnocentric. They not just the victories of the great white man. They they tell the stories of everybody was uh, that was there. Okay, so please watch the film, uh, the Black Legend, Native Americans and Spaniards, and then come on back. Okay, so so at the time of Columbus or just before Columbus. Uh, and, and and estimates vary, 50 to 100 million people indigenous people in the Americas North and South. Uh, 20 of those were just in Mexico. So the, advanced, the most advanced civilizations in that era were in Mexico. The people in Mexico were ahead of it, their time. A very dominant society, uh, 20 million people living there at the time of Columbus. A very sophisticated societies, you know, not the stereotypical hunter-gatherers, they had cities that were far more advanced than European cities at that same time. Uh, 250,000 people in Tenochtitlan, which became Mexico City. Uh, at the same time, London had 50,000, so five times bigger and, and modern. Uh, so the, the idea, you know, if, if you are a person of Hispanic background, Mexican background, you, you have a long and noble heritage. Your, your lineage goes back to this. These are advanced people, uh, and you should be proud of that. I, I know that you don't always hear that in, in our, our culture today, but that's the truth, okay? Uh, a man named Bernat Diaz del Castillo was a, a conquistador uh, with uh, Hernan Cortez, who we'll talk about here in a minute. He describes Tenochtitlan this way. Some of the soldiers among us who had been in many parts of the world, in Constantinople, all over Italy, and in Rome, said that they had never seen so large a marketplace and so full of people and so well-regulated and arranged. So here's a man that had been all over the world, and he's telling, telling us that Tenochtitlan was the most advanced uh, never seen a, a place so uh, regulated in a range. It was, you know, organized. This, this is what would become Mexico, and he's referring to this capital city of Tenochtitlan. So this, 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 this area of Mexico that we're talking about, with all these people with the Mayans and the Aztecs, is the brown area on the map there. So, so today we're, we're talking about southern Mexico and parts of Central America is what what we call today Mesoamerica. This is not what they called it in their day. It's what historians call it from today. We don't call it Mesoamerica today. We, we talk about, talking about this era of history is, is called Mesoamerica. The Aztecs and Mayans dominated this region called Mesoamerica. They conquered all the other tribes from that region. Uh, they killed many POWs, prisoners of war, in ritual slaves to ensure fertile fields. So these were fierce savage people. When I tell you the story, I don't want you to get the idea that these were nice, serene, sympathetic people. These were savage warriors, and, and they, they killed a lot of people indiscriminately, okay? Uh, and again, human sacrifice to ensure fertile fields. Uh, 
the Aztecs and Mayans in Mesoamerica, the Incas we'll talk about later, in South America, three very advanced civilizations that, that were cut down by the Spanish conquistadors, a much smaller force. How did they do that? We'll get, we're going to find out in this chapter. Why did the conquistadors come? <clears throat> they wanted their gold, which the, which the Aztecs had much of. They want their wealth. They want their land. Okay, so we're going to get back to to that story um, later in this chapter. But first, let's talk about other civilizations that were in the in the Americas. So what would be the United States, the Mississippi Valley, the Ohio Valley? You have what were called the mound builders, the Adena, 800 BCE to 100 CE, 900 years, the Hopewell. Uh, 200 BC to 500, 700 years. <clears throat> so, so that doesn't seem like a long time, perhaps, but measured against the United States, who've been here for 220, 20 or something, okay? 240, I guess it is now, uh, or, or so. <clears throat> you, you get my drift. We, in, in, in history, as solid and as, as uh, much of a foundation as we think we have, we, we're still very much in our infancy when you compare other civilizations and empires as far as time, okay? Uh, <clears throat> okay, so so the so the mound so, so these people are in the Mississippi Valley and, and they did not match the Aztecs, Mayans, and Incans in size, but they still were very stable civilizations that lasted for many years. So the Adena, the Hopewell were mound builders. So what are these mounds all about? And you see some are very simple. Uh, and this is a Ancient man with a modern day staircase for tourists to go to the top of it. Most of them look like this, but some were very elaborate. Here you see the serpent man. You see his tail here and it comes around. He slinks around. It's, it's like a long snake. So what are these mounds all about? These people constructed various styles of earthen mounds. And they were mostly for religious and ceremonial purposes, but, but also for burial. Uh, they were built to bury important members of local tribal groups, uh, rounded dome-shaped structures, typically with diameters between 50 and 100 feet. And inside of the mounds, bury with the remains of, of the important member of the tribe, they would, they would um, uh, put artifacts in, artifacts obtained through long distance trade. Um, so obviously, to to do an archeological dig in these mounds, you're going to find some, some you know, valuable, uh, artifacts and 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 so on. Okay, um, it, it's it's interesting. I'm re we're about to watch our second film, and it'll go into a little bit more there. But I want to be specific about Thomas Jefferson here. So where how is he coming in this picture? We're not anywhere near him yet, are we? In, no, but but moving forward a little bit, just to give you some background. Thomas Jefferson grew up in Virginia, where there were mounds around where he lived. So he knew about these, and they were mysterious, and no one really knew what they were. Uh, you know, people thought that the natives, the indigenous people that had been here long ago, built them, but we're not really sure. Maybe it was some far, you know, long ago civilization from somewhere else that came here and built these. But uh, the reason why I'm, I'm talking about Jefferson, Jefferson became the first person to oversee an archaeological dig on a mound. So understand Jefferson was a very bright guy, scientist, very educated had a huge library that, that's where the Library of Congress started when he was near death. He donated his library to the to the, to the government and they started the Library of Congress around it. So uh, this is an inventor. Uh, this is this is probably the brightest guy of the founding father. So so he understood the scientific method and knew that you can't just start hacking away at a mound. You, you got to do it systematically. So he oversees this archaeological dig. Uh, and he determined, after seeing the complexity of these mounds, that they couldn't have been built by Native Americans. They, they, they couldn't have been sophisticated enough to, to, to build these layers. And, and it's hard to see a little bit, but you've got, you know, layers in here. You've got, you've got skeletons down here. You've got different layers of artifacts and all, all kinds of uh, items that were buried in this mound to, to honor this person, whoever that person might have been. Uh, so, so Jefferson determined right away that because they were so sophisticated, it wasn't possible that, that, that the natives did that. They were too inferior, had to be white people. So where do these people come from? And he thought, well, maybe it was the Aztecs. They, 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 they're more advanced. So maybe, maybe they came all the way from Mexico up to Virginia to build these mounds. Doesn't seem likely. 
uh, but he couldn't he couldn't come to grips with the indigenous people have the ability to do something so intricate and detailed. Uh, this has since been disproven, and the, the native people were the ones that built these mounds. And the, the film that you're about to see will will um, go into detail about that a little bit more. Okay. Uh, before we watch that film, I'm going to talk to you about one more um, settlement civilization, Cahokia. So Cahokia was on the Mississippi River. And to give you some bearings today, if this is the Mississippi, St. Louis would be right here. So, so Cahokia is on the opposite side of modern day St. Louis. Very large society, as you see here, 600 to 1400 CE. So another, another long um, empire, 800 years. Uh, Cahokia was the center of ancient society in North America, was as large in its day, okay, in, 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 in this era, as New York and Philadelphia were before the mid-1700s, before the revolution. So those were large cities, of course, not nearly as big as they are now, but in that era, Philadelphia and New York were large cities. Cahokia was, was as large as they were in the 1700s. Um, okay, let's go ahead and watch our film. Uh, Please watch the film entitled The Mound Builder's Cliff. It's not very long. Go ahead and watch the film and then come on back. Okay, the film, the film shows maps of, of what would become the present day United States. It has many cities in it, settlements. Uh, so again, most of us have not been taught this. This is not what I was taught. I did not learn when I was young that when Columbus got here, all these cities and settlements were here. I, I thought they were savage people. This is what I was taught, running around with no real organization. So, so not, not at all. This is the way that it was, very populated, lots of people here. Uh, so understand, very vast and very culture, living here long before Columbus. Uh, and, and the truth is, as the map uh, indicates, there were many of these societies in America, many more than we were led to believe. A another uh, uh, settlement and people are the, e are the Eastern Woodland. Sorry, I could somehow got a little glitch there in my slides. Uh, the Eastern Woodlands Indians. Uh, so they would inhabit the Eastern part of the United States. And there you see a huge part, the green there on the left. Uh, this would include the Algonquin. Um, they cultivated corn, beans, and squash like most did. Uh, the, the northerly tribes relied more heavily on hunting because they didn't have the, the, the vast lands like the south does to, to grow. Uh, you also had cold winters, so they, they, were, they relied more on hunting. Uh, and this, and the, the, the tribes in this in this Mississippi Delta developed farming and trading uh, as their economy, okay? Uh, the Iroquois uh, Confederacy in the north along the shores of Lake Ontario uh, began as five tribes, Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Mohawk, warring tribes that were constantly at each other's throats and constantly, you know, uh, fighting, fighting with each other. And, uh, Usually run by a single chief. Uh, they're primarily deer hunters, but they also grew corn, squash, and beans. They gathered nuts and berries, and they also were fishermen. Uh, but they finally formed a confederation because there's power with numbers. So the Iroquois Confederacy re resulted in these five tribes coming together. Uh, so former enemies that had lived side by side south of this lake, they were known as the Five Nations. Later, they added the Tuscarora. They became the Six Nations. So it was Hiawatha, and you may have heard of him in elementary school, the, the poem of Hiawatha. Uh, it, was Hi it was Hiawatha that, that brought these people together and inspired the tribes to form a confederation. Uh, let's stop killing each other. Let's come together in solidarity and gain some strength. So they do. So this, the, the Iroquois would be, become the, the most formidable of the, of the Europeans to, to defeat. Because they were so big, they were almost as large as the, as the European powers were also, or all the rest of them were much smaller. Uh, anytime you see a born C1525, C means circa or about that time. So we don't know exactly that that's the exact year, but it's somewhere around there. So circa means kind of like an estimate, okay? 
So these tribes that had been at war for years uh, became cohesive when the United became a very powerful force in upstate New York. And we're going to hear more about the Iroquois. They're a huge part of the, of the first half of this class uh, up to the revolution anyway. An interesting thing about the about the native tribes where women had influential roles, leadership positions in many native tribes, this was not being done in any fashion in Europe. Uh, Europe was patriarchal, male dominated, and they brought that idea with them. So the white Europeans that came to the Americas were very, very male dominated. And many people would argue that we still are. Uh, in Europe and in the Americas, European people, women were not allowed into leadership, business, or political positions, but many tribes did. In fact, some were ruled by councils of women, and leadership was gained through female lines of authority. That's called matriarchy or matrilineal. So matriarchy means a society that's dominated by women or run by women. Matrilineal means the power is handed down to the bloodlines of a woman, where in Europe it'd be a patriarchy or male dominated, and the power is passed down to the oldest son, patrilineal through the through the male bloodline. So the, the natives gave women more rights than the Europeans did. Uh, so you you have this kind of visual image. You think of a Native American Indian, you think of this, you know. Uh, uh, man with not people with not, not much clothes on, uh, hunting, gathering, uh, nomadic, okay? Uh, and this that's what comes to our mind. And, and many tribes live that way. Don't misunderstand me. Many live that way. Like I said before, many people today, you know, aren't as modern, as progressive as others. It's not everyone's the same, whether it's now or then. Uh, but key to understand, many many did live in what Europeans would call a more sophisticated society. <clears throat> okay, moving across the country to the plains, the Great Plains there in the middle goes from Texas all the way up into Canada. And this is a different type of geography, no trees, no mountains, it's not a lot of water. It's the plains, it's like a savanna, grasslands. Um, you know, you don't have a huge, huge rainfall and this is not a place where you, you might be be growing what you could be growing in the south uh so the plains indians are what the europeans called them um and they're, they're known for utilizing the horse now understand the horse was not here until the europeans came the europeans brought horses here natives did not have horses before columbus came uh, so this changed their life. This, this, this for the better. They can now hunt faster, longer. They could go to war better. They could travel. The, the, the horse changed their lives. It became more dominant in in warfare. So um, a couple examples of the Plains Indians are the Comanches and the Sioux. <clears throat> okay, back to our map. What about the Southwest, where where we are here? Uh, you have the Anasazi or Pueblo Indians, New Mexico, uh, also Arizona. Very still, very uh, fantastic ruins there. I was there a couple years two back. Um, uh, unbelievable. You can trace trace the, their their them back as far as seven thousand years ago. So they go back a long, long way in Arizona. And and like I said, the, this is what you can. Th these are modern pictures of of the ruins that are left. These are very, very interesting. Sophisticated, built into the hillsides, cliffs to protect themselves from the sun, the wind. Uh, they had, uh, you know, a not not much water, so they built sophisticated irrigation systems to manage the low supply of water. Uh, these are advanced people that that uh, made the best of what they had in in their geography. Okay. Uh, well, what, what about San Diego County? Uh, what tribes were living here in, in the area that we live in? You have the Degenos in the south. So, so why are they called that? Well, this is a European name given to the Kumeyaay. Okay, the Kumeyaay is what they were called, what they're still called. Uh, but the Europeans like to give indigenous peoples their own names and we'll see evidence of a lot of this i mentioned the anasazi and the hohokam they call them the pueblo people well that wasn't what they called themselves but the europeans called them pueblos because they saw the the uh hillside uh you know settlements they saw them as pueblos they defined them as pueblos so in this case they called the the, 
the natives that lived around Mission San Diego, the Diegueños after Diego. Okay, that's where that name came from. <clears throat> uh, but <clears throat> again, the, the actual name is the Kumeyaay, and, and they're, they're still a very well-preserved site right off of Poway Road. You can go there, and there's a little museum there. They're open on weekends. I actually did an internship there a number of years ago, right in the middle of the city, and you have evidence of this settlement and tools found from 10,000 years ago, and they take you on a little tour up on the rock kind of croppings, and you can see evidence of kitchens and places where, you know, food was prepared. It's very, very interesting. Um, 10,000 years old. Uh, what about the people in the natives in the north, North County? So again, the, the, the natives that were around the mission were called Luisenos after San Luis. Uh, their actual name is the Payamcoatum, okay? Uh, so again, the Europeans changed their name. Uh, they didn't have any say in this, this idea. So I, I know that if you, if you went to California schools, K through 12, we studied the missions I did, you did probably in the fourth grade. That's what we've been doing for years. And for the most part, and of course, you don't want to teach fourth graders about the dark side of people. Uh, young minds aren't ready for that. But the truth is what we were taught about the Benevolent Father Junipero Serra and and the Jolly Friars and and these 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 wonderfully nice people that, that came to to help the the the, the poor savage natives is, is not entirely true. The 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 Spanish came and subjugated these people, the, the natives. They they brought them under their control and forced them to work for them around each mission. Uh, they forced them to convert to Christianity, and they and they, and they took their lifestyle away. Uh, these people were not allowed to to practice their religion or speak their native tongue, and they were they were uh, coerced in 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 a brutal fashion to become more like become Spanish like them. Uh, so in this effort to convert them to Christianity, their lifestyle was taken away. Okay, let's go to our Next film here, and this film is entitled California Native Perspectives. This is a modern day, uh, you know, look at uh, talking to some indigenous people that have roots back to this time about how how they see the history, not and it might be different from what you learned. Okay, go ahead and watch that film. Okay, so the Spanish system was was not a was not a benevolent system. Uh, like you learned in the fourth grade. So it, it also didn't start in San Diego and, and go north, uh, you know, one by one. <clears throat> they actually built four at the harbors first. So what harbors do I mean? <clears throat> San Diego, Santa Barbara, Monterey, San Francisco. Those were the four main missions. They built them first. All the missions built in between were designed to be one day apart by horseback between each one. So most of the business was at the Four Harbors. So if you wanted to get from San Diego to uh, Santa Barbara, two, two centers of you know, power because they're harbors, you would ride one day to, to, from San Diego Mission to San Luis Rey, the next day to San Juan Capistrano, the next day to San Gabriel, next day to Santa Barbara, Buenaventura, Santa Barbara. So five, six days, you'd be there. Each day at the end of the day, you'd have a place to stay. So that's what the missions in between were built for. And not to suggest they didn't have any other use. They still were there to convert the natives of that, of that area, bring them under control, make them work for them. Uh, most of them were enslaved and, and were forced to live around the mission and do their bidding. Okay, uh, So this is, this is a, the part, part of the history that we don't really like we don't we we didn't hear it we don't like to hear it okay and of course the 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 film goes into great detail about it it was it's it's a tragic story okay so each of the four harbors had a presidio okay we have a presidio here uh presidio park is um just above old town you can see it from the eight freeway uh the the uh, museum up there is pretty prominent and there's ruins of the old um it's not there anymore the original presidio but there's ruins there so each of the each of the presidio um i'm sorry each of the harbors had a presidio to to protect it the other the others didn't because there wasn't anything there to worry about i mean not to suggest there wasn't anything but it wasn't like the four main main places 
So the interesting story happens in San Diego. So today, if you go to Presidio Park, why is the mission so far away? Why is the mission, I don't know how many miles, three or four miles, five miles east. Why is it, if the, if the Presidio is there to protect the people, why is it so far away? And the truth is, the original mission was in Old Town. What we have today is Old Town. That's where the original mission was. But the problem was the Spanish soldiers in the Presidio kept uh, assaulting the native women and abusing the native women and raping the native women. And it got to a point where it was so bad that they had to move the mission away from the soldiers to protect the women. So they moved it to where it is today. But I'm not, I mean, take a good look at that. Think about that. They, they, they moved the women away from the people that were supposed to protect them. So that's a, that's a strange one there, okay? Um, okay, let's move to African empires, African people, because uh, they're part of the story too. We're talking about three peoples here. So I mentioned before, West African imperial system. Th th these were the huge wealth. This is Mansa Musa, the, the wealthiest man in the history of the world. Had so much gold, he gave it away everywhere he went made a famous uh, pilgrimage to Mecca, like Muslims do. And on his way, he was giving out handfuls of gold everywhere he went. The price of gold dropped because he flooded the market. This is a man that had more money than you can possibly imagine. These were very wealthy, prominent empires. Uh, and you know, the Ghana and Mali and Songhai, and you know, this, these were... These were very prominent um, civilizations that aren't given credit. You don't learn about this in the United States. Typically, we don't like to glorify, you know, people that aren't like us or, or aren't like Americans or what an American is considered to be. So much like the I mentioned before about the Mexican heritage comes from a long noble heritage. If you have African descent in you, you also come from a very long and noble heritage and should be proud. And again, you don't always hear that, but it's the truth. And it's not just me talking, it's 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 there to see. Scholarship will tell you that. Africa had very advanced empires that far surpassed anything in Europe at that time. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so I said before, modern man, homo sapiens began here and emanated out. Generations of great empires rose and fell like anywhere else long before the Europeans showed up. A uh, hundred million people were on the continent before the Europeans came. So we're not doing African history in this class, but just to be clear, the Europeans also colonized Africa with the same result. And, and that is what would diminish these people. Same thing with the, with the uh, Hispanic people and the Mexican indigenous people in the New World. Uh, because of disease, and we're and we're we're heading there, okay? Uh, so that, as I mentioned before, the 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 great tribes, uh, tribes, empires, Ghana, Mali, Songhai, also lasted many years, 400 uh, years, 200 years, okay? Uh, very powerful, wealthy, uh, had much gold, and these empires were obsessed with it. Did everything they could to get it created huge wealth, with wealth comes power and authority. And, and these are the people that, that mastered the trans-Saharan trade. So I'm not gonna get too deep into this because we've already talked about it in our supplemental lecture, but I mentioned before, trans means to get across. So you wanna you know, figure out a way to, to, to get across the, uh, the desert itself. Uh, trans means across, sub means below, okay? Uh, so you'll, you'll, you'll hear trans-Saharan, sub-Saharan. Uh, it, it's just simply, telling you what what direction to go okay uh these empires created extensive trade networks all through africa with their trans-saharan trade routes uh as a way to get to that european market so i know i'm 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 repeating myself but this is what the chapter's talking about and that's an actual satellite picture that's a real live picture of the earth you can see how big that saharan desert is uh daunting imagine try, having to cross that of course, it keeps going, but um, you know, over here and up into uh, the other parts. But this is this is this, the Saharan Desert of Africa that we're talking about. Uh, so so again, like, you know, like the people in ancient America, these people had a very proud past and empires and progressive and and um, we're we're not the 
you know, the, the uh, roots are not the savage and uncivilized people that, that, that perhaps many people would like to describe them as, okay? Okay, what about the Europeans? Western Europe in the 1500s, this is, this is white Europeans. Um, and, and the truth is, and again, it's not, it's not my opinion, it's scholarship. I'm just sharing it with you. The truth is, out of the three, the Europeans were not as developed as the Native Americans or the Africans. They did not have the great empires that the other two groups had. Now, they had had those. Okay, you go back to the Romans and the Greeks and others. You go into world history, ancient world history, uh, you know, all around the Mediterranean. We talked about that being a center of trade. But when, the, but when Rome fell, it fell hard. And you have a long Middle Ages, this, this nearly thousand year period of darkness and renaissance uh and this this would go on until you have um i'm sorry not darkness and renaissance darkness and ignorance this this period would go on until you have a renaissance uh, i mentioned the enlightenment earlier in 14th 15th and then later 16th and 17th century so this brings you out of this of this uh time but the time of Columbus, you're, you're still kind of getting on your feet. So the, the European people were not as evolved as the others. What kind of society did they have? It was all about the people at the top with power, kings, queen, queens, princes, ruling class, nobility. Power was passed down by bloodline, patrilineal, from the, from the father to his oldest son. It, it didn't matter if you were inept or incompetent and unskilled in leadership, if you were the oldest son of the previous king, you came to power. There's no vote. People had no, no say in the matter. The wish, wishes of the people meant nothing. And we see this over and over in European history, the feudal system, uh, oppressive, okay? So uh, Europe is an amazingly complicated history. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's complicated and it's hard to, uh, keep track of it all you know european historians have a have a which i am not by the way but european historians have a uh you know a challenge to to get it all together about who was who and, and, and what was going on because it's complicated it goes back and forth and all over the place you've got all the all these different kind of kingdoms especially in the middle ages that weren't connected and they're all fighting with each other so it's it's a complicated history uh so it's interesting, uh, you know, Europe, Europe, you have the seeds here of a culture that never really rises to the top as a power. So um, that, that's kind of a mouthful. And of course, I have European descent in me, so I'm talking about my own people here. But it's the truth. Even though they came to, to America and they immediately dominated, it was the people that came here, the colonists, that later became Americans and no longer Europeans. They're the ones that raised, at that time, the white culture to a dominant place. So we're gonna talk a lot more about that in the next couple of chapters. So I mentioned that Europe was a patriarchal society, male dominated, men governed families. Uh, remember I said that native tribes, some were matriarchal, power passed through the maternal bloodline of the, of the mother. Europe was about men being in power head of the household, the clear dominant voice in politics and business. Women were considered by Europeans to be too delicate and fragile to deal with any responsibilities. And here's a quote from your book. The woman is a weak creature not imbued with like strength and constancy of mind. Law and custom subjected her to the power of a man. So of course, most women today would get a little angry about that, but this is the way it was back then. Women had no rights to property. Men pressed, passed their properties on to their sons. This is called primogeniture, one of your terms. Uh, women had no access to business or politics, no access to gain any sort of power or leverage. Their job was to maintain the family and the home. There was an interesting study done um, uh, many decades ago, I don't exactly know when, but let's just say older school historians, older school European historians came up with this idea. And the question was asked, why were there so many prostitutes in Europe at this time? And uh, the study came, the old school study came up with the fact that, that it was because, you know, women, women were uh, provocative and, and, 
and uh, this gave them a chance to to ex to experience sex in 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 large portions. Okay, uh, so that that's that's pretty that that's pretty uh, insulting if, if you're a woman to, to suggest that you know women across the board in Europe just wanted to have a lot of sex that they became prostitutes. That's that's uh, you know that's that's pretty harsh. So modern historians, you know, looking back in time and, and looking for truth, not not myths and legends, or not ways to insult people. Modern historians have a different different look at it. Why were there so many prostitutes in Europe? Well, because of this idea, this this male dominated society. So if you were a married woman to a man and and the man and you had wealth of some sort and and your husband died. The, his property and money in estate doesn't go to you. It went to your oldest son. Didn't matter who he was or what he did. That's just the way it was. There's no question here. If your son determined he didn't like you as his mother, you got to understand. You know, going back that far, people weren't nice. I mean, I, I don't know if you've learned how to be nice as a people until post World War II. It's it's pretty hard to find you know a whole lot of sympathy. People weren't always nice. People were you know, express their their kind of, you know, in, in innate uh, ideas of greed and selfishness. That's kind of who we are at our core. We have to learn to not be like that. We have to we have to work at it. They didn't do it then. So if a if a young man who's just inherited his father's estate doesn't like his mother, he can just throw her out in the street. If she happened to have, you know, young kids that that are still still in need of, you know, being brought up and protected. She's now on the streets with herself and a couple of kids. So what does she do? She can't get a job. She, she can't go to school. She can't learn a trade. She can't go into politics. She can't start a business. She can't really do anything. How do you survive? Well, you, you know, you, you beg, you, you, you hope for charity. You, you hope that maybe your son will give you some, something to, to live on. Uh, but what if he doesn't? So as a woman, one way that they could make money was to become prostitutes. It wasn't because they wanted to. It, it was not, not because they were, um, you know, uh, sexually motivated. It's survival, survival of themselves and survival of their children. So this is a, another this is the real reason why there were so many prostitutes in in um, Europe at that time. Uh, so, of course, we in American society today, our modern times, we still have a society where women are trying to gain access to opportunities to gain equality with men, uh, equal pay, equal opportunity. The Constitution does not say anywhere, even today, that women specifically have the same rights as men. There was a movement in the 20s and then later in the 1980s, the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, this came very close, and, and this would do that, give women equal rights. It came very close to passing in the 80s, but came up just short. Uh, th this this all comes from our European roots, okay? The, the the white Europeans that came brought patriarchy with them, and we've been fighting that, that ever since. Uh, okay, so so patriarchy in America began in Europe and was well in place in Europe centuries before Columbus came here, okay? Uh, also in Europe, there was a vast difference between the nobility and peasant society. So people would argue, isn't it the same today? We, we've got a lot of friction and strife going on with labor because the people at the top, you get all the money and they're a small percentage. You know, 1% have 99% of the wealth. 99% have 1%. I'm making those numbers up a little, but you get, get the idea. Uh, those aren't actual numbers, just for example. Um, so working class now and then, right, it hasn't changed. Uh, in, in those days, uh, if you were a peasant, you were a worker. Uh, your job was to work hard to make the king or the lord that was above you rich. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Uh, you know, the idea was for the people at the top of the pyramid, the, you know, this was a dominant society that held the bottom of the pyramid down, oppression. Peasants had no opportunity to advance in society. This is a huge reason why they all came to the New World. Let's start a different way. Okay, so it's a great story in, in that context. Okay, the last section of the chapter 
is uh, the age of discovery, a time of exploration and conquest. So again, discovery is a word that makes me cringe a little bit. The age of finding places is what it should say, because there are people there. You can't discover something that, that's already there. So we, we talked about the desire to get, to get products from China, from Asia. We talked about Marco Polo and this, this obsession that he began with, with Asian goods. This began a wave of exploration because they're trying to get to China. So their purpose was twofold, explore, but they want to trade. They want to get Asian goods. So it was the Portuguese that went out first. Uh, they they kind of head out into the world and they're trying to find a route to to India, but along the way, they run into West Africa and see all this gold. Okay, so that, that kind of gives them pause. Maybe we should not worry about China and think about dominating here. So you know, again, history is about trade, but sometimes greed, but still trying to find a route to Asia. So Vasco da Gama of Portugal becomes the first to sail around the Cape of Good Hope in Africa. So imagine in those days, starting up in Portugal where Spain is at, no one had any clue or idea how long Africa was. You've got to go all the way around it to, to get over there. He's the first person to actually turn the corner, and then later he would sail all the way to India. What, what did he do in India? He set up fortified trade posts. So when I say fortified, that, that means not very friendly. Uh, so what it wasn't a friendly, I'll trade you one of these for one of those. No, we're here to dominate and take over your trade. Uh, this is called Cape Coast Castle, and this is still exists. And this is a this is an old um, you know castle there, uh, very dominant, powerful, authoritative. What they would do is get slaves and house them in this in this castle until they until they came across the ocean. Had they, they had enough to come across the Atlantic, okay. Uh, and of course, you, you have the, the start of the slave trade in the Americas. I don't mean the slave trade in general. Slavery been going on forever. Slavery been in Africa for for centuries before the Europeans can. Uh, organized by black people enslaving black people, just like everybody else did. They, people enslaved people. Who who were slaves? Prisoners of war, from battles, convicts, debtors. Okay. The, these people weren't found by kidnapping them like we come later. Uh, and usually, a prisoner of war or a convict would be a slave for a period of time, not lifetime. I mentioned before, America would introduce lifetime slavery because of the color of your skin. So the, the quest for slavery was always second to the, for the, in the quest for gold. What they wanted was gold, but along the way, they see this opportunity. I'm talking about the Portuguese still. Uh, and it soon became obvious to them that wealth could be made in human trafficking, slavery. Uh, the Portuguese started the plantation system, this idea that would come to the Americas, come to the New World, especially in the South, as we know as United States history. The plantation system of hundreds of slaves working in the field at the crack of a whip. The Portuguese start this really as an experiment, a small island called Sao Tome, S-A-O-T-O-M-E. Sao Tome is a little speck of an island off the west coast of Africa. The Portuguese uh, go there. It's uninhabited. It's volcanic soil. It's, it's made for agriculture, and they start to uh, plant sugar, and they bring Africans over as slaves. And this worked so well. And all the other European powers saw, saw it, that they all used it as a design. They copied the Portuguese. But when they came to the Americas, they did, they did the same thing. So you have the rise of the plantation system. Uh, we haven't got to the United States yet, but that will be a, a huge part of our class is learning about that. Okay. But as, as America popul populated north and south, uh, you have the rise of sugar plantations, especially later in, in the, in the United, well, become the United States tobacco. And of course, cotton would be a big one that we'll talk about at the end of this class. Uh, another Portuguese name, named Pedro Cabral, uh, in, a, in an attempt to sail around Africa, gets off course and runs into South America. So this is interesting. Uh, Columbus ran into something he didn't know was there, had no clue where he was. This uh, Pedro, trying to get around Africa, goes, goes too far to the west and hits South America. So per perhaps the, the, not the best navigators here. But what's important about Pedro Cabral, he, he finds 
that I didn't say discovered, finds present day Brazil. Why is that important? Because Brazil would, would create a plantation system that was far bigger, probably six to seven times bigger than anything that happened in the United States. Another place of you know, oppression and enslavement and cruelty you know, with slaves on sugar plantations. Okay. Uh, okay. So we talked about Spain a little. We, we we talked about you know they they come to the New World, and these are conquistadors. So it, you know give them credit for at least being honest about who they are. We, we're here to conquer you. We're not here to you know be nice to you. We we want to beat you up and take your stuff and, and we're going to be cruel to you okay we're conquerors uh and this is what they do they they come to the americas and and they 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 have this plan they're, they're they they want to go to uh mexico of course it wasn't mexico then um they want to go to tenochtitlan and conquer them because they know that, that, that the aztecs have much wealth so they have this idea. Of course, you can't you can't run a campaign from Spain; it's too far away. So this is a this map, and just briefly, we'll talk about the others first before we talk about Spain. But here you see all the you know Europeans that came and and the European colonies that were started. You've got the Russians all the way up, all the way over here in Alaska. They come all the way down to almost San Francisco at one point. The French. Come to the Saint the Saint Lawrence River and have the Mississippi and Ohio valleys. The English, you know, Jamestown and Pilgrims and so on. The Dutch, Swedish, all these countries come to colonize the Americans, Americas. Now understand what colonize means. It means you're coming to get raw resources from the land. You're going to take those, and you're going to use the people that are there as your labor resource. It's not a friendly visit. A, a, a colony is not a resort. A, a, a colony is about subjugation in, in the pursuit of wealth. And all these raw materials you're going to send back to your mother country for manufacture and gain wealth that way. But we're talking about the Spanish. So what the Spanish did is they, they, they came south. They first come into the Caribbean islands and they killed most of the native peoples there, and they use this as their command post to then attack uh, Tenochtitlan and the Aztecs, okay? Uh, so, of course, the, the question is, okay, that's nice, but how many ships could they have? How, how many conquistadors actually came? How do you attack a fortified city with a quarter million people in it? Most of them are fierce warriors used to warfare. How how do you defeat them? How did how did this happen? How how did the English? I've already said it would be a distant third if you're going to rank these as far as as uh, you know uh, progressive, okay, of that era. Um, how did they do that? Well, this 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 is the interesting story. So I mentioned Hernan Cortez before. He's the leader of the Aztecs. I'm sorry, the conquistadors that defeat the Aztecs. He he wants their gold. His superior said, "Don't." Don't go there. You don't have enough men. You'll, they're they're going to crush you. But he is overcome with, with greed, and he wants to go and get this gold. So he takes a, you know, a number of ships, and uh, probably hundreds, perhaps more than a thousand men. But but even if it was five thousand men, which I don't think it was, how how is it possible to approach a fortified city of a quarter of a million and win? Uh, so now to okay, part of it was weapons. It, it, it is true, the uh, the Spanish had had perfected metals much more than the Aztecs had, uh, and so the so the Spanish had weapons that that the Native Americans had never seen: muskets, cannons, weapons that shot fire out of them. So that intimidated the Aztecs. They they thought these are evil spirits. You know this fire that that scared them. The Aztecs only had leather armor, wooden shields, bows and arrows, wooden clubs, wooden spears, or stone tips. They hadn't perfected metals, uh, but still, you outnumbered them, you know, incredibly. Well, what the Spanish did, they also recruited all the other tribes in the area to help them fight the Aztecs. The reason why the Aztecs came to power is they defeated everybody and and they not nicely and then they and they sacrificed them and killed them and enslaved them. So all the tribes around Tenochtitlan that had been defeated were happy to join the Spanish to knock them off. So Cortez's uh, uh, 
people, uh, his, his force grows because of that. Uh, but still, not, not a chance you can topple this huge city, even with all those people. Even with, with all, all the tribes, and you, you don't even come near. Uh, you, you might have had a quarter of that force of 250,000. So how did it happen? Well, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, if you go to Barnes and Noble or any any large bookstore, you can go to the history section, and most of the history sections have a section inside of it called military history. And there's hundreds of books there, and you can you can get books about any war or battle you can think of, the Romans, uh, you know the the uh, Napoleonic Wars, the Crusades, you know moving into the Revolution, the French Revolution. Uh, Civil War, World War One, World War Two, Vietnam, you know, all these wars and many, many more. You can find many, many books about each one, and you can you can study the tactics and military strategy used by these commanders to win or lose these wars. Okay, one book you'll not find there is a book about the battles between the Aztecs and the conquistadors, because there, there wasn't any, and not, not to suggest there wasn't any kind of battles or that there wasn't any kind of combat at all, but not any great campaign, okay? So so how'd they do it then? How, how'd they march up to this, this fortified city with far less people uh, against the savage people schooled in military? How did they win? Well, it's it's a very simple answer, and it's called disease. And they brought disease. Uh, they didn't have any idea that they had disease. This was a secret weapon that, that came. Um, they could have left their muskets and cannons at home and walked up, you know, uh, unclothed, and they would have defeated these people because the natives had no immunities to European diseases. It, it, the European diseases killed up to 90% of the people. 90%, so 250,000 becomes 25,000. So that's how they did it. So I always use the analogy, if you look at a classroom, typical classroom in a college class, let's just say for fun, you've got 40 people in a typical college class. And on our campus, our class is known as the biggest and the baddest, and, and we're the best class, and nobody can touch us, and, and everyone knows that, okay? They stay out of our way because we're the best class. But then along comes a new class. They've got, they've got 15 people in their class, and, and they are across the hall from us, and they challenge us. We think that, that we don't like you. We, we, we want to... We, we want your stuff. We want to be the best class. So they, they challenge us. And we, we're laughing. There's 40 of us against 15 of you. We are used to this. We do this all the time. We're going to crush you. Okay. But you have a, you know, a, a you, you, you come together and you talk about, you know, uh, we're going to meet and have this, have this battle and you interact with them. The 15 people come into our classroom under, under truce. We're just going to talk about what's going to happen. And they interact with us, and they say, "Okay, we'll meet you on the uh, uh, quad on Tuesday, and we'll have it out. And whoever wins will be the best class." And we're laughing because, of course, how could you possibly think you're going to defeat us? They leave. They go back to their classroom. We're in our classroom now, and we're all laughing. Isn't that funny that these cocky, arrogant people would think that they are going to beat us? But then slowly. One by one, we all start to die, and 90% of us die. So what is 90% of 40? Come on, math majors. What is that? Four people, okay? So if 90% of our class dies, there's only four of us left, and not necessarily the four strongest. We don't know who's going to be left, only four. So now when we go out, out on the quad to meet the 15, we've only got four. That's how they did it. I'm, I'm going to go more into detail about this story of disease and where it came from and why Europeans had had these diseases and why they were immune to them uh, later in the class. But for the purpose of right now, the, the point I'm trying to make is the, the European people conquered the Americas not because of military, uh, you know, acumen and and strategy and and fortified numbers and and 
and you know um, all this incredible uh, uh, tactics and knowledge. It didn't happen like that at all. If disease had been part of the uh, of the uh, of the issue, the Aztecs would have defeated them pretty handily, but they all died. So that's how it happened. This is how it happened. The, the Europeans had a secret weapon, disease they didn't know they had. And when they came, the, the natives were wiped out by it, okay? Uh, another conquistador after the defeat of the Aztecs decided to go down to South America where the Incas were. And Francis Pizarro, another conquistador, he had south and did the same thing down there. But by the time he got there, the, the disease from Mexico had already spread all the way to San Francisco, I'm sorry, not San Francisco, South America, and half of the of the Incans were already dead. So Pizarro just walked in, didn't have to do too much at all, okay? Uh, so I understand, the point I'm trying to make, <clears throat> these expeditions of conquest are hardly models of military expertise and precision. They didn't receive any resistance because most had died. They, they, they couldn't come up with a, a, a defense. They, they, they couldn't, you know, uh, create a, a force to, to hold these people back. Uh, it was sheer luck. And the most effective weapon they brought with them was silent germs, much, you know, deadlier than any rifle or cannons. So, so the natives were defeated. So remember I said there were 25 million people in Mexico and what was Mesoamerica about 1500 at the time of Columbus. Uh, 1650, 150 years later, so what is that, four generations or so, only 3 million remain. So 22 million people died in a, you know, a, a fair amount of time, but that's a lot of people to die. And, and a former powerful and strong empire is reduced to, to nothing. Okay, this is how they did it. Understand the vast majority of these people didn't die from battles or conquest. Some did. They didn't die from being enslaved, but the vast majority died from from disease. Okay. Um, okay. So um, so it's important to understand this it, it, out of chapter one, and, and perhaps it's one of the main points of this class that I'd like you to learn is that, that that's the true story of of how Europeans came to power in America. When your people came to our land, it was not with open arms, but with Bibles and guns and disease. You took our land, you killed us with your guns and disease, then had the arrogance to call us godless savages. Okay, so this is how it happened, and the Spanish took charge, and they start this precedent of, of subjugation. Uh, not, nothing about any kind of benevolence or sympathy here. We're going to take advantage of people and, and for, for, for wealth, okay? And this policy of extermination continued in, in you, until you could argue the early 20th century. Uh, okay, so it's, it's important to understand the foundation of the cruel behavior that was done to these people. Uh, this is another direct quote from your book. Everywhere in the, in the Americas, core beliefs and worldviews were shaken by contact with radically unfamiliar peoples. Native Americans and Africans struggled to maintain autonomy in their relations with colonizers, while Europeans labored to understand and profit from their relations with non-white peoples. So indigenous natives, Africans struggling to, to keep their life while the, while the Europeans come to power and they try to understand what this, what profit means, and what this, what this is about, and and of course they are brutalized in in the in the uh, in the doing of that. Okay, uh, okay. So let's see. So this is the this is the collision of these three of these three people that your that your um, that your uh, chapter is talking about. Okay, that is the end of chapter one. Thank you.